I want to welcome you today uh, to the, um, gosh, I'm so used to Ralph. Ralph and I uh, host Exponential Webinars. So I still want to say uh, the Exponential, but this is actually the Ministry Ninja uh, webinar. And, you know, the, people ask me sometimes, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because obviously I haven't grown up yet. My answer is always going to be Ralph Moore. Right. When it, when I am a full grown Peyton Jones, hopefully I will look like a Ralph Moore. But um, my next book, actually, uh, Church Plantology starts off with Ralph. And here's why. Um, years ago, Exponential uh, looked for what they called a level five multiplier. And what a level five multiplier is, is it's a church that reproduces itself. Um, so well that it's reproducing to the third generation. So you're planning churches that are planning churches that are planning churches. So they kind of like back when William Randolph Hearst sent out his team to find certain works of art, Exponential sent out people to say, hey, where can we find a living, breathing, walking, talking level five multiplier? And they came up with zero. And they, they finally got a hold of Ralph and they asked him, you know, how many churches are you planted? And and remember now, this doesn't have to be Ralph himself, but when Ralph put out an APB to all the, the people he had discipled, all the planters he had trained, all the people he had deployed, out of his ministry, um, I think originally, Ralph, didn't it come back to like, it was something like 1,300 at first, which was like small potatoes. What, what was going on was I, I was running around the world. I, 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 I spent a lot of time in developing nations. I, I, I've been in 30 some countries and uh, most of them very poor. And, and you know, so whenever you go to a place like that, you're a big deal, whoever you are. <laughs> and so I'd be teaching about church multiplication and and I just had an estimate. I, I've, I've, I've planted three churches in my life, four now, because we just started a, a digi church on Saturday night. And I've helped about 80 guys, a little over 80, where I directly, you know, was discipling them on the way out the door. Somebody else discipled them into Christ. I was discipling them on the way out the door. And, you know, we've been good. The churches I pastor, we've been good for about a church and a half a year. But then they plant and they plant and they plant. In one place in New England, we go nine generations deep. And um, so I, I was telling everybody about, I thought there was about 1,400 churches. So then Exponential calls me up and they start asking me these questions. And I told them that, and then I start waking up every morning going, you liar, you exaggerate. There's probably, if anything, maybe 900 or 1,000. And so I actually, then I, I just went into my Outlook contacts and just started emailing everybody uh, this little questionnaire. And it was to follow up on, you know, have you changed your name? Remind me when you started. How many churches have you started? How many, you know, give me their email addresses. And I, and I pushed it. And I ended up with this horrendous Word document. But at that point, there were 2,317 churches. And then by six weeks later, when I went to Exponential the first time, we had, we had found like uh, five more. There's 2,322. And, and so then um, I started getting the guys who never answered my first email, writing me angry emails why didn't you include my churches in your list? Because I, I mailed the list, emailed it to everybody who had first questioned. And so there's a little, we know of a little over 2,400 churches. So that's. Yeah, that, that, that's all. And and from what I understand, the, the, the numbers are still coming in, you know, but, um, and I know Ralph, you know, for you, it's not, it's not like, oh, hey, you know, it's not like a pride thing. I, you're pretty down to earth and you're, it's one of the reasons that I respect you is to you. It's, it's all, I remember asking you, you know, what was the secret to this? And you're like, I've just discipled three people at a time for 50 years and you do that and see what happens. And I think there's so many people out there and I, I, I know this kind of works this way for you. Um, but the idea that there are so many people out there who want to be a thought leader, they want to be the idea people. They want to be the ones that are seen as gurus. And then there's people like you that are just practitioners. They're just getting it done. They're just doing it. And that's the thing that to me, it was kind of like that Proverbs where it says, you know, let someone else um, praise you. And, and it was just to me, it was after all these years, man, for that to come back, for someone else to say, this guy's a level five 
multiplier rather than you coming out saying, hey, you know, I mean, it, it, it just and really you, the fruit of your ministry is just people, you know, it's disciples. I mean, that's that's the key. It's not this big church to show. I mean, you've you've pastored big churches, um, but you also, you know, have your focus in ministry, and I think this is really telling, has been discipling people. So as we as we head into this, um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you um, today was, you know, we, we want to talk about planning out your ministry journey because I know for you, your ministry started, you, you kind of started one direction and God really wrecked you from, from the beginning. And, and here we are talking about you know, 20, 2,400 churches later. Right. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you the floor. Um, I want to say at the outset, we're going to let Ralph at the end, um, kind of, uh, direct you towards some other resources and things, but if you'll just look off to, uh, his, his left, but your right to the right of his shoulder there, um, his left, you'll see a book there called let go of the ring. And that is, I've, I've interviewed Ralph a few other times and gotten to know him. And I'd say we're friends, but uh, Ralph, Ralph will tell you that is probably his most significant book. I will tell you his church planning book. Uh, he's written many books, um, but, but his, you know, planting, his church planning book, you can see it's got a red car. That book's awesome. Um, I've, I've had people just read that book and plant and they're on their third and fourth church plant. So uh, anyways, Ralph, thanks for coming on. I'm going to hand you the floor, brother. Thank you. You know, I, um, I, I, I really am a, I, I, I'm real serious about how I use my time. I, I, you know, ever since I was a very young person, I've been serious about how I use my time. You mentioned books. I, I, I've got about five or six books that I wrote with Regal, which was bought out by Baker. And um, as soon as I got with Exponential, I got, I got hit by Baker and two other companies. Would you write another book for us? And it's, I'm 75 years old. I don't, I don't have time to be fooling around writing a book that's going to take two years in the birthing process. And, you know, so I, I've just kind of gone to, I still write stuff, but I pop it out on Amazon. But, but that fits with what I want to talk about is early on, I, you know, I grew up in a big church, the largest church in the state of Oregon, and the largest in our denomination. I was in a Pentecostal denomination. And in those days, um, you know, they're writing books about churches of a thousand being like a mini nation. Lyle Schaller was writing that kind of stuff. And so uh, we we're in a church of 1300. And that was like a big, big, big deal. And it was pretty sophisticated and all that. But I go to these youth camps and everybody there that were pastors, I, I felt for, sorry for them. A lot of times they worked in a gas station to support themselves. I look at those guys now as heroes. In those days, I looked at them as losers, but I kind of thought I was going to be one of them. And uh, they, they take their two weeks vacation from their secular job and come and take care of kids in a youth camp and with the wife staying in a dorm with the girls and the husband staying in a dorm with the boys, which is no way to have a vacation. But, um, you know, I, 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 I kind of thought that's what God's calling me to. I, I, I hated the idea. I didn't want to be a pastor. I knew from about probably age six or seven that God, something my dad said one day, just, it just hit me and it, and it just made me angry. I'm a little kid and I was just, no, that, that's not going to be me. And I was all excited about the Lord and our church and all that, but no. And uh, so when I finally gave into it, I, 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 th I thought I was going, I had a, a town figured out in Eastern Oregon called Primeville, which turns out to be a pretty lovely place now. But when I went there as a kid, it was just a little dust bowl. And, and I'm thinking, I'm going to probably end up in Primeville pumping gas and, you know, I want to be an architect. And so I, I, yeah, I, I fought that whole thing, but I, 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 I was pulling weeds in a churchyard i helped a church called east hill church in gresham oregon get started uh, in my freshman summer after one year of bible college and and they got a new building the, the the denomination invested in them they had this horrible old building with a parsonage that the roof had burned out of it and they just left it standing there for 20 years and and so i went up there and helped this guy jerry cook as he was getting started and and I was out pulling weeds in the churchyard and I concocted this plan. And it was really a level four plan. You know, it's 
it's been so good for me to be involved with exponential because it's like they kind of explained to me how I lived my life. And by the five levels deal, it's been really useful. And the tension that I always had with the level three guys mm -hmm. who wanted to be level three and I was trying to push them and we'd always get in the wars, you know? But so my plan was that uh, that five to seven times I, I was gonna, I loved the ocean. I was gonna move to the Oregon coast, plant a church, raise up some young kid, send him to a Bible college and then bring him back and hand the church over to him. And I'd move 20 miles down the road and start over. And, uh, and so that, this is my big, you know, and so there's scope to this. There's actually a certain amount of vision to this. Uh, the limited vision is I thought that if, you know, if I could pastor 50 or 60 people, that's probably a very big deal. And if I can do it at the, at the ocean instead of in the desert, that's a bigger deal. And that's kind of where it went. And, 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 and so I, I had uh, really bought into the idea of leveraging what you have. And, you know, I, when I was in college, uh, you know, I, I'm, I wanted to be an engineer. I'm a pretty good student, but I, 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 could, I couldn't sing. I couldn't dance. I couldn't play the trumpet. I couldn't play guitar. I couldn't do all those things that were the hip, cool things to do. And, um, and so I, I came out thinking, well, you, the best way that I know to leverage is what Jesus did, and that's make disciples and then transfer authority to them. When you read the Great Commission, and I, I used to think of it as Jesus going, he's got the hammer, you know, all authority is given to me, therefore, bam, you do it. Uh, I, what I realized is he's saying all authority is given to me, I'm giving it to you. You can do what I did. You got make disciples. And so... I begin to think in those terms. I ran into a guy named Don McGregor in the Philippines uh, when nothing was happening spiritually in the Philippines, but the denomination I was a part of, they were having 55, 56,000 converts a year. They were planting churches like crazy. And what they'd done is they'd broken the mold, uh, which they had created. And we go into a big city like Manila, build a big church, then build a Bible college and send people out from the Bible college. Uh, the, the, people inevitably would drop out of the Bible college and, and but they go back home to their home village and they need some people the Lord McGregor was blessing it and calling it a church and that was like massive watershed thing a guy named Jim Montgomery wrote a book that's still on the internet and if people can't find it on the internet and they want to contact me through my website uh, I'll get you the book it's uh, I've, I've got ebook copies of it I can give you for free it was called Fire, New Testament Fire in the Philippines. And, and so then I met McGregor and he challenged me really, really hard. And, and uh, you know, by this time, by the time that I met him, uh, I already had blasted through the 60 people. We're, we're like 120 people in our church and, you know, and we had started one church. And so it's like, oh, we're, we, we got some traction here. And so he hits me up. What are you going to do? Are you going to going to do something great for, he made a joke out of it something great for jesus yeah. and uh I, and i go yeah he goes what are you gonna do and i go and build the biggest church i can and and he, and he yanks my ear and goes you didn't understand the question and he asked me the same question i gave him the same answer he steps away i only have met this man like for four minutes yeah. he I had him come to speak at our church guest speaker he steps away from me and kicks me in the shin hard enough that i bled and goes, if you want to do something with your life, make disciples who make disciples and, and plant churches. And so it's like, wow, I get it. And so then, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a time management guy. It's like, I only got so much time. I got so much ability. I got so much whatever. And, um, I, and I ran across, I, I, was, I was a youth pastor for a while before I became a pastor. And, you know, we were really into reading Proverbs. We, we got everybody these little, we call them a pocket rocket, little you know, just only the book of Proverbs, like, and, and everybody carry that around and just read whatever the, the chapter of the day is, but we got it in the living Proverbs. And mm -hmm. there's a, a, a verse in that says, steady plotting brings prosperity. Hasty speculation brings destruction. There's another verse that says, you know, complete your work in the fields before you do your work inside the house. And so that began to put some priorities on the way that I'm going to live my life. I'm going to keep making disciples and keep sending them out. And that's more important in building this church that I'm a part of. And, and if I can just keep this thing going and I can manage my time, I can manage my future. 
and something good will happen. And, I, you know, I had no idea that, you know, we think there's like a quarter of a million people going to all these churches, but I had no idea of anything like that. It's just that we were starting churches and, and we're, we're going from there. And, and then, um, and, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued that you even asked me because you asked me earlier about time and use of time and, and all that. And, and I, I ran into a book, I can't remember where or, or how, but it talked about um, just organizing your days. And, um, and it, it was like, you know, take everything that you got on your to-do list and put it into uh, A, B, C categories. And then under A, um, make a hierarchy, one, two, three, four, again, in order of importance. And if you get through all the A's that you that you marked out and you never get to the B's and the C's, well, at least you got the most important stuff done. And so, you know, I, I look at uh, young pastors. I, I think one of the one of the biggest problems that I see is people really don't fully understand how to manage their time and and uh, and, and and to and to leverage the use of their time. I was in Hungary a few years back and I met a guy and he was bragging about that. Uh, you know, he's, he'd been in Hungary for two years and he's at the point now when he rides his bicycle three miles to the coffee shop where he parks himself every day. There are people that he he greets and they greet him back. And it's like, oh, oh, that's what you did in three years or two years. It's like something, you know, something's uh, out of whack here a little bit. Um, it's it's so easy to pick up. And, and, and you know, to me, the I, I, I've been asked recently to Put together like a TED talk on the Jesus that I knew, and you know I, I really met Jesus by by I was in a silly kind of a Bible quiz, uh, and you know back in the fifties, and I memorized the, the Gospel of Matthew, and I see Jesus always had time for the little people, always had time for the broken people, and what I found out is that those are the people who are gonna they're gonna suck up whatever you got to offer them. And so it's just, again, manage, manage my time, uh, manage my priorities uh, and in terms of focusing all of that always on uh, those people that I'm discipling in. So, you know, that's kind of life in a nutshell for me. Um, you know, as a, as a pastor, pretty big church, a couple thousand people every weekend. Um, we, we would we got into planning and, and and this is maybe a little bit off the point here but i mean we were every year we go away for a, you know prayer and planning retreat and come up with some entirely new thing for the next year and it's just like we're ping-ponging we're just all over the map because every year we're the we're the product of the latest book we've been reading together and um and i and i ran into a, a friend who's an architect and 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 I was, I was complaining because I'm not good at like a five-year plan. I, I'm always doing one-year planning and tell me five years. And, and he goes, nobody can do five-year planning. And that was, that was encouraging. And so he goes, what you really need is a 20-year plan. And I go, what do you mean a 20-year plan? And he goes, where do you want to be in 20 years? And I go, well, I want to be, this was like, I was like 60 years old. I want to be alive, uh, be married to the same woman. Um, I, I, I probably want to live back in California. Uh, he goes, see, anybody next to Peyton, you, you didn't know that then, but now you would say that next to Peyton, you didn't know yeah, that yeah, that yeah. was on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyhow, and then he goes, just, you know, cut it in half and you got a 10 year plan and, uh, and then cut that in half again, you got a five year plan and then stack up the next five years, one on top of the other. So one rests on the shoulders of the other. And again, it, 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 so much of this just comes down to building a priority system that represents the scripture into your life. Because so often what I meet with young guys that are frustrated are the priority structure that they built represents what's hot right now in, in Christian circles and or, or how are we reacting to COVID or whatever. We've got to get beyond that. It's got to be a bigger, longer term vision for what we're going to do with the one life that we have. That's fantastic. And I, I so agree with you. I, I often, often when I read those, the next 10 things that we, you know, I'm always like, yeah, you're full of crap. <laughs> you have no way of knowing the next 10 things. But what, you know, for you, Ralph, you know, I love that you bring it back to your own personal time management 
to a T, every one of my heroes in the faith, Wesley, um, Luther, um, Lloyd Jones, Spurgeon. Uh, I, I know I'm leaving it to, I have so many heroes that time management was a key, like they really wanted to impact, um, and also influence. And I, I guess I think about, um, impact where impact often is you at the center. Um, you make a splash or whatever, but what I hear you saying is something that, that I think is even more powerful and that's influence that, you know, a lot of times people want that impact on the ground, but you're talking about something that is more kingdom oriented, more eternal and more sustaining. Can you speak a little bit into that? Um, the influence versus impact. Yeah. Um, you know, impact is immediate. It's what, and we did some pretty, uh, you know, once in Hawaii, we did some pretty, well, even in California before we did some pretty big things. We, you know, we were the biggest church in, in the South Bay of Los Angeles. Uh, for a long time, we were the biggest Protestant church in Oahu until New Hope came along. Um, we started 60 some churches in Hawaii impact. And so it was, it was significant. Mm. Five, five percent of our town was, were in our church. Um, we we're only in a town of 40,000 people, uh, Kaneohe, Hawaii is in Honolulu. And so, uh, you know, that, that's, that, and that's heady stuff. It feels really cool. You know, it feels really, hmm. you know, I, I, I remember after, after 9-11 happened, I was in, I was in Washington state, couldn't get home because of, you know, they shut down all the planes and everything after the, the disaster in New York. And um, so our guys, uh, they, they popped a big outdoor prayer meeting. We had a, like a, a outdoor stadium area our church campus and they, they they blocked traffic for over a mile and a half uh people trying to get in we thought well we we're something you know but that doesn't really count for all that much because it goes away and but but what really counts is that i i was in europe a few years ago and i i met a guy from madagascar who i had um been involved with a guy named bill gross when when i was leaving Hermosa Beach to move to Hawaii the last few months. And, and Bill was kind of a wise guy and, and uh, always making jokes out, out of things that just shouldn't have been made jokes out of. And, and, and one day, I won't, I won't use the word that I, I used, but I, 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 I walked by him. He was with some friends and they were goofing off. And, and I, it, it, while I was preaching, they were goofing off in the, in the back of the auditorium. And I, and I walked by and I go, if you weren't such a wise person um you, you you might go someplace someday you know you you could you actually could plant churches and do something well today he's like a bishop or something for the denomination that he's a part of but he he started a church in in torrance california and then he moved to Cary, north carolina and here i am years later and i meet a guy from the church in Cary who's a, a missionary in i think it's madagascar and they planted over 200 churches and, 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 and that's influence. And, and the influence is relational. It has to be relational. If you don't have that connection, you know, and, and uh, Bill and I still, you know, make jokes about the words that I used that day and uh, the relationship that we have, that we still have all, all these years later. But when we're talking about influence, um, he, he, here's the, here's the downside to the Hope Chapels is we, we, in, in, in a way, it's an upside, but it's also a downside. We never built a network. We just kept releasing, you know, disciple and release, disciple and release, disciple and release. And um, we, we never did like an annual gathering or, we, I mean, even when I had to go find out how many churches there are, nobody had a list. We had to build a list because we just don't do that. We, we kind of started out in the hippie area. And so that was part of our ethos just you know you don't keep track of things you just everything's organic man you know just that whole deal but um and i think i think we actually probably went further and planted more churches because of, we had such a loose hand on people but the flip side of that is now that i've left hawaii uh wayne cordero has pretty much left hawaii he comes and goes he lives in oregon and i was with a, a friend of mine who plants churches and but not real rapidly and i asked him you know who who 
who is the center? Because the, the center was me. And then after Wayne came, there were two centers. And, you know, we did things differently, but we, well, we did them. And both of us in our tenure in Hawaii, uh, there were like 63, 64 churches that came out of each, each person's life out of the, in, in Hawaii, besides whatever else went on around the world. And, um, and so my friend said, well, there is no one. You need to come back here. And, it's, and he was talking about, you know, come back and do a meeting or something. But the truth is, it's it's all it's all slowed down and so if it's all about impact the impact has pretty much gone away uh the the churches that we planted are still there but they're not setting the world on fire but in the fringes in in in, in lima peru and madagascar and you know in new england and in in europe they're they're planting churches uh and they're still doing it and and so the locust has moved to these other places and so as, as we, you know, talk about these things, I, I think that um, it's, it's really, really important that we be always thinking that long-term thing, that thing that's farther out from us that we can't really get our hand on if we wanted to. You know, three generations away from, from me as a church planter, most of those guys don't even know my name. And when I die, they won't even know it happened. And I think that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's so funny you say that because uh, uh, the church I planned in Long Beach, I'd go back there and people had no clue who I was. And I kind of got off on that. I thought that was kind of cool, you know, because the church had morphed and moved on. And, you know, it's not like you want to turn up and say, hey, everybody, I planted this church like like a moron. You know, you just kind of it, it's not about you at all. It never was supposed to be about you. And I, I you know, the weird the only person it can be about was Jesus. And yet even in his ministry. You know, like when you're talking, I'm just thinking back to like how Jesus, for those three years, it was primarily about equipping those 12 in front of him and all the, you know, the 72 and the other, like he was still just primarily equipping them. He was taking them on mission, getting them ready and influencing them like that. That's so powerful, you know, um, but I, I have a question here from uh, the peanut gallery. Um, cause I get to call it that when I'm running a webinar, right? We don't have to be professional, but, uh, the, uh, somebody said when saying make disciples that make disciples, so this is a different exponential, right? I have to behave when we're doing that one. So do you, Ralph? Although I don't know if anyone makes you behave, Ralph, but I've seen some unhealthy examples of make disciples that make disciples. Some people try to make people exactly like them and other times idolize those that they're learning from. How do we avoid these pitfalls? Can you lay out what the heart of discipleship is? I see that all as kind of one question. They're they're trying to avoid that by getting to the heart of what discipleship is. Well, to me, the discipleship is follow me as I follow Christ. But you're not me, so you're not going to you know. I mean, Paul, you can translate what he said as imitate me as I imitate Christ. But again, I'm not Paul, so and you're not me, so I'm not asking you to be me. So the way we, the model we built, we stumbled into this. We, you know, we had um, started out as, as with, with a lot of Navigator material. I grew up in a, in a Sunday school that used Navigator type materials, you know, fill in the blanks. And, and I'm the only kid in this big church that I ever knew, including my brother and sister, whose father made him fill in those blanks for all the years of his life. It's like, I, God used my dad to give me this Bible education uh, because I it was just, and, and I don't know why. My, my sister didn't have to do it. My brother didn't have to do it. I had to do it. And my dad tried to talk me out of being a pastor. So it was a, you know, just one of those things. But so when we started out, it was all about the intellect side of everything. You know, you know churches are really good. There's a, there's a book that I've been reading. In fact, I got it right here uh, called The Other Side of Church. And it talks about left brain, right brain, and that so much of what we do in church is left brain. We, we are data centers and we deliver a lot of information, but people don't change because of data. They change because of the people that they're around. And that's the whole point of the book. And um, it, it, that, you know, as a, as a child, if they put a EC or whatever they do on a, to, to major brainwave on a little kid, uh, the right side of his brain, the artsy side, the music side, all that will light up when he sees his parents because 
there's love there. And, and, and this is why street gangs are so like, effective and make you disciples that we have accepted you. You're part of us. You, you know, come, come be one of us. And, and, and people, they change, their character changes for good or for bad. And so what, what happened to us is we, we, uh, we struggled for spaces to meet. We were growing really fast, up to about 400 people. Uh, but in those days, that was a pretty big deal. And so about five years in, we moved to this bowling alley. And uh, it was an acre under roof and then an acre of parking underneath that. And we popped from 400 people to 800 and some people in one week and lost our identity. We went kind of goofy. Uh, guys, the hippie church, right? And, and all the people who had come to when we were in the gym and all those other places, uh, suddenly we got this top drawer address. We're on our Artesia and Pacific Coast Highway. Everybody in Los Angeles County would know it instantly where that is. And it looks over the ocean, you know, beautiful piece of property. And so uh, all, all these kind of uptown people start showing up in church. There was actually a Rolls Royce in our church for like five years. And I made it my business to never find out whose car that was because uh, I was the pastor of all these guys that drove rusty old Volkswagens. And, but some of our staff guys start wearing suits to church and it, we just, we lost our identity. And then we begin to realize that during the Jesus movement thing, we had had a lot of Bible studies, a lot of NAV studies, a lot of just, you know, Calvary Chapel kind of Bible studies. It just, it just happened. And when the revival was over, it was over. I mean, that's kind of how I actually knew it was a revival. When, when good things were happening to us, I, I did fall prey to pride and think I'm pretty smart. This is all happening because of me. And then when the revival was over, it was like, oh, it's over. You got to figure something else out of here. But as, as that happened, um, what, what, what had also had happened is we, there are no more small groups in our church. And so we kind of came up, we stumbled into this thing of uh, some educator had gotten to us that if, if you can get somebody to talk about what they heard somebody say, they'll remember twice as much of it long term. So the idea was if within seven days, if they'll try to repeat what you said on say Sunday morning, then they're going to remember twice as much long term, which means that they'll basically probably remember 2% instead of 1%. But I become twice as good a preacher if I can just get them talking about what I said. And so we kind of built this thing, this model around that and it, and it morphed, it took a little while, but it just broke into this thing of while the pastor was talking on the weekend, what did the Holy Spirit say to you? Question one. So now you're, you're sharing life with these people. Uh, there has to be love and acceptance and forgiveness or it's not going to work. The second question is, what are you going to do about it? So now you're making yourself accountable, at least to yourself. And then how can we help you? And spiritual gifts begin to emerge without taking little spiritual gifts, inventory tests, and stuff like that. And so um, we, we've, we then took that same little model and put it over into leadership groups. And you don't get into a leadership group unless you're leading somebody or helping somebody lead. So we're not, we're not using these things to recruit people but we're using them to disciple people. So we'll read books together and, and they're not always Christian books. Sometimes they're history books. Sometimes they're, you know, secular business books, but we always ask the same three questions. What did the Holy Spirit say to you? What are you going to do? And then how can we help you? And, um, and, and so what we find is rather than come be like me, it's come follow Jesus. Like I follow Jesus and be like you in the process. And, and let, let's build around what, God's saying to you rather than what I think he's saying to you. And that that's really, us really well. That's really good. And I, I, it's always been one of my favorite uh, parts of your um, discipleship and some of your coaching is what's the Holy Spirit and saying to you, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I think that's so, so powerful. And people often don't ask that, but uh, one of the other questions this is probably the uh, we're, we're going to, um, maybe take one question after this one, but, um, we're going to have a, um, a, um, breakout afterwards that is exclusive to those in new breed. Um, so that, that will be, uh, I'll drop that link in the chat. And, um, one of the things Ralph, that, uh, is a really good question, which I think I'm still trying to figure out, 
I think Paul was on a on a bit of a learning curve as he was leaving and exiting churches. One of these questions is, how do you identify your replacement so you've got a clear exit strategy? Oh. That's a doozy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's called prayer and fasting. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, it, 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 it went off really well twice and, and one time not so well. And oddly, the, the time that I thought was going to be probably the best was the time he'd go off so well. But I, I was, uh, when I knew I was going to leave Hermosa Beach, was, uh, I, I actually was on, I, I, this is in the book, Let Go of the Ring. I saw a vision, and I don't even believe in visions, you know. It's like, if you tell me you had a vision, I think, what have you been smoking? And I was on an airplane on my way to Hawaii. And I, 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 I was walking down the aisle to go to the bathroom. And so very spiritual moment. And the scene just flashed in my mind. I could see myself like full size. And we were standing up on the side of the mountain overlooking Kaneohe, Hawaii, which is green and beautiful. And the bay is lovely and all that. And it was like, I'm in the clouds looking down. So I'm aware of being in the airplane. I'm aware of being in the clouds. I'm aware of looking down on myself on the side of the mountain. I swear to you, I wouldn't tell people this, but when we finally got land and, and had a 10 year fight to get a building permit, I knew that was that was what I had seen in the vision. And so I saw a lot of, a lot of black haired people. Um, people in Hawaii have black hair. And uh, we were all like normal size and the town and everything was shrunk down maybe to the size of a football field. And, 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 I, and when, it, when it hit, it was like five years and the word dominant came to mind. And the next thought I had was, you like Kaneohe, it's beautiful. You love Hawaii and you're just making this up stupid. And so I just erased it. And I came home 19 days later, I came home from my vacation and a friend of mine comes to me and, and asks, um, anything unusual happened on your trip? And he had told me, he's praying for me. He's getting ready to go to Montana, plant a church. And he'd come and said, you know, God told me to pray for you every day. And I go, well, thank you. And, and he goes, no, but you should be praying for me because I'm the one going out to plant a church. So, you know, 19 days after I have this experience, I've totally blanked it. I don't remember any of it. And uh, he catches me on this. On the, I was coming down the steps at church. He was coming up the steps. And he says, did anything unusual happen? I go, no. And he goes, well, remember I told you I was praying for you? Yeah. He goes, I, I was sure the Lord told me you'd be caught up in the air and given a vision of your future. And I go, well, you know what? If God wants to do something like that, my vacation gets over tonight when I get up there and preach. So he better hurry up. And I went on home, just cynical as could be. And about two hours later, it just hit me like, oh my gosh, this is this is real. And so I wouldn't tell my wife. I told my friend Aaron Suzuki. And then that idiot tells me, oh yeah, that's interesting because I felt like God's been calling me back. To, he grew up in Hawaii. I felt like God's been calling me back to Hawaii to, to start a church or something. I just didn't know what to do. And so for all, about it, Oh, probably nine or 10 months. We just kept it to ourselves. And, um, and then we told our wives and, you know, they got everything to lose. We had no guarantees. We went there, um, no place to meet. Uh, we thought we had a place and they pulled the rug out from under us. We had some money, but our fallback was uh, we were going to start a, a automotive and motorcycle garage because uh, we both were good with cars. And then, and then we'll, whatever happens, we're going to plant this church. So, um, I'm, I'm getting old here. I think I've lost sight of your question. No, you it was the, it was the exit strategy, but your, your buddy oh, was, okay, you, so, you said that you got the, uh, you, you heard, uh, yeah, so, dominate. So here's the deal. Um, as, as, as I'm getting ready to go and we're starting to get ready to where we got to talk about this thing, at least with the church council, I'm in prayer one day and there's a guy named Tom McCarthy, who's a, a medical doctor who was uh, on teaching staff at UCLA, uh, about my age, uh, a couple of years older than me, I think. And whenever I would travel, I was going around teaching guys how to plant churches in those days. This was like 1980, 81. Um, Tom would preach. And so the plan always was, if Ralph dies in an airplane crash, Tom's the guy. And, and it was we'd written that down. So we knew where we were going. And one day I'm praying and there's this guy named Zach Nazarian who's a pharmacist. 
who had uh, been, you know, really kind of lived an ungodly life and his wife left him with his, with his business partner. And, uh, and, and he was, he was angry that the church was there. He, he, he had visited our church and I'm standing up there telling people, we're going to get this bowling alley and it's the promised land. And he thought you're an idiot. And then the weekend that his wife left him, uh, that, that our sign went up that weekend. And he was furious when he saw it. It was a Thursday. He's driving by. He's furious that that idiot got that building after all. And then Saturday, he, he comes out after he, filling in for some other pharmacist. His wife, his car's gone. He knew instantly. He went home. Everything's gone. She cleaned the house out. And uh, he, 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 he said, at first I was so angry, I would have killed them both. And, and then I got on my knees and I, and I opened my heart up to God. If you're there, show me yourself. And he shows up in church the next day. So he's, he's been with us now for several years and he's on staff and he's graduated from a seminary and all that. And so one day I'm praying and, and I, I felt like the Lord said, it's supposed to be Zach, not Tom. So I go to Tom and, you know, cause he, he wanted the job and he was willing to give up medicine for it at that point. And I go, Tom, and he goes, no, oh, that's the Lord. That's exactly right. So then we went to church council. I go to the church council. And I, and I told him, you know, that I'm leaving. God's called me. I'm going to go in like 24 months or something. And they go, who's gonna, like in chorus, who's going to take your place? Zach. And, uh, and I go, that's what I think. That's what Tom thinks. They go, well, that's what we think. And that's how we made that decision. Um, when I left the big church in, in Hawaii, my son took over. That was not a plan at all. Uh, but he's running this great big youth group in a little tiny church in California. They got like a 120 uh, high school kids in a church of 200. And uh, we're a church of 14, 1500 at a time. And we got like 80 kids in our youth group. And our youth pastor left to, to plant a church and that's going gunzo. And, and so we, we brought my son over and he was all suspicious. He's afraid we were trying to rope him into becoming the pastor. And that wasn't our plan at all. But as soon as he started preaching, people started asking him for him. And so he took my place. And uh, unfortunately, he's uh, gone through a divorce and he, uh, you know, everything was clean and upright and all that. And, uh, but he uh, decided to get married again. And he left the church to go and, and focus on marriage and family and starting over doing other things. And it's really exciting, a real fun time right now. And so it went, it's gone really, really well, but there is no formula for me. I, I wish there was, but there, there isn't. Uh, all, all you can do, all I've ever done in my whole life is watch for who has a follower, because if they have a follower, they're a leader. And including some 11 year old girl that everywhere she goes, there's two little girls that follow her, that little girl's a leader. So you should get to know her or get to know, make sure somebody gets to know her. And then that's, that kind of has just served us, you know, all the way up and down the ladder. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you're leading somebody, then we're going to invite you to come help us lead some more people. And then if you do well as an apprentice, well, then we're going to hand off to you when we head out. And, and, you know, that's just how we do things. That's really cool. And I, I you know, I, I love the thing that makes me laugh about the question is, you know, uh, the question was, um, hey, you know, uh, how do you identify your replacements? You've got a clear exit strategy that presumes there is one. And I don't know if there actually is a clear exit strategy, Steve. So, uh, you know, I and here's the thing is it's been different for me every time I've left a church. And, um, I think that one of the, the, the clear things, even what I hear Ralph saying is it's not always the dude that you leave there. Sometimes it's just that dude's there for a time or, you know, uh, that person is there for a time. And then it, it's really like, I, I remember the first church that I recognized as an official church plan, I had planted a couple others, but uh, without realizing what I was doing. And then, but when I planted this one called pillar, um, it's the guy who's there now, you know, I'm, is the guy that was always meant to be there, but he wasn't ready. He was still being discipled by the guy I handed off to. 
but now he's amazing. So, but um, we're running out of uh, time for this portion, but a um, couple, couple things uh, you can see again, let go of the ring, which uh, ties in a lot to what we're saying where Ralph is constantly like, stop holding on to stuff, let go um, as God leads you move on. Um, that would be a really good resource um, based on what Ralph has said. And also, Ralph, I know you're um, you're coaching. Like to me, it's still mind blowing that I can I can call you up or sign up for coaching with you, and you will coach people. Like that that still to me is is that's mind blowing. So um, tell us a little bit about the people who um, you know uh, are on here. Just tell, I don't know why it's in the day, but. Uh, you know, the, the magic words I'm looking for here. Tell them about your coaching and, and how can they find out about it and how can they track with you? The easiest way to, to uh, find out about it is to go on my website, just ralphmore.net. And there's a thing that says coaching. If you go on the website and you sign up, you get a freebie book or whatever. And I start sending you emails. And I, I put out a blog every week and now I've been making the blog into a YouTube and I'm getting a lot of traction. I'm surprised at that. Because I'm, I'm hmm. an old footy. Wow. You know, it's, just, it's like, th these are things that young people do. And and I'm 75 years old. But anyhow, uh, and then I, I tried to do a podcast every week. And and then out of that, I started coaching people. And I, I was coaching some big churches. And I, and I didn't really want to do it. So I when they, they asked me, I, I, I came up with a horrible amount of money. And said, yeah, I'll do it for this much money. And I did it. It was rewarding. But then I realized... That's not really who I want to be talking to. Uh, I, I really want to be talking to a guy that's, that's you know, got, you know, 70, 80 people and he's trying to get out of the hole and, and figure out how to reproduce and he's young. And so going after the young guys. So I created this platform where I put out a video uh, and then a bunch of supporting materials every two weeks and on a like second and fourth Tuesday. And then first and third Tuesday, people who, you know, go to the next level up uh, we talk live and so I, i'm trying to upgrade it a little bit i think maybe uh put some select sermons in there and make it available maybe a, a facebook group there's a facebook group now for uh the people who do the live thing but i limit that to 12 people so uh but there, there's probably maybe it's not a big deal maybe 50 60 people are involved in this whole thing but it's 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 proven pretty fruitful so far and, wow. and actually what i'm doing is some of the guys who sign up for the coaching are the guys as i as i get to know them a little bit now i they're the guys i want to put on the podcast and and uh, i'm trying the, the goal of the podcast is to, to have to hear from ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things wow. uh, most podcasts are you know somebody who's done huge things but i i want to hear from you know the, there was a guy recently in north carolina church of about 200 people and uh he, he started a thing called before covid god in a bar and he just buys a couple drinks for whoever shows up uh two two drink maximum he went to the bar and said I, I want this whole section all these chairs i'll buy two beers for every chair if if nobody shows up i'll still buy <laughs> the two beers and all the wings that they can eat and, and if no one comes drink. i'll drink them all <laughs> yeah. and, and he invites a bunch of Christians to come, but you can't come if you don't bring somebody who's either mad at God and quit church yeah. or doesn't know the Lord. And then, and then he throws out a real open-ended question about the Bible. And it's not like the Romans road or something. The scripture that he told me he used was the demoniac of Gadara. And, huh. and he goes, if there is a God, what do you think he's trying to tell us through this story? So good. And, you know, let, let, just talk about it for 20 minutes. And then and then he, he does, the, this was amazing to me. He goes, when I, I go, how do you end it? And he goes, well, I just tell, I get, he goes, I tell him 20 minutes, but I give him about 45. And then I stand up and go, well, you know, the official part of this thing is over and I got to go. So you guys can hang out if you want to, but bye. And he leaves. No pray, no preachy, no nothing that looks churchy. And he goes, these people stay there for two or three more hours talking and uh, there's four people at a table. So you got two of them that are either mad at God or don't know him. And two of them that know the Lord. And he goes, and the other thing that's happened, he says, people have come to Christ. But he goes, 
the guys who know the Lord are starting to come unglued and talk about him in the marketplace. And, yep. and so I want to hear from guys like that. Yeah. I don't want to hear from some guy that's got 10,000 people yep. in church and now he's created, you know, a little network of five churches that look like yeah. me. Yeah. Um, anyhow. Yeah. Well, you're speaking my love language right there. In in my uh, upcoming book, Church Plantology, there are two whole chapters outlining how to do church in public space because that's my passion. That's that's what we tapped into. You're you're. I've never done it in a bar, uh, but I've done it in a, ca- a gay coffee house. And one of the people pointed out that I just uh, plugged my book, and I'm supposed to say "cha-ching" on my other podcast, but this is not that podcast. So. <laughs> 